Thomas from At The Gates. You're watching Loud TV. Wow, it's, uh, I mean, it's 30 years since we formed the band. The band hasn't act been active for all those 30 years. So it's, uh, it's not as long a journey, but of course, everybody were active in the hiatus of the band with other projects. But I, I guess for us, it's um, we learned a lot, and uh, I think finally now in the last few years we kind of made peace with all our, you know, all the other albums, all the legacy and everything, and we are now very fully aware of what makes at the gates at the gates, you know. I guess the the nightmare is more uh, well, I would call like a metaphor, of course. The nightmare of being being the metaphor for you know uh, the torment of of, of life, basically. Yeah. You know, and to dream for the night itself was more uh, a metaphor describing the creative process of an artist, like the when the music or art that you do speak through you, you uh, indulge in in the night a little bit. But then at the end of the touring cycle, I, I started uh, th this journey, like this uh, reading journey and philosophical journey. And I talked to Jonas that I really wanted to make a, a really full and rich and deep record, a lot of, you know, dark introspective stuff going on in the lyrics. And was he up for that? And then we started writing and all of a sudden we find ourselves uh, very inspired and very deep down in the <laughs> process, so to say. For us, doing this album, we realized how big of a project it would be. Like this amazing journey with all these different guest musicians and uh, different orchestrations of parts and stuff. We needed someone that was very meticulous, very hard on us to, to uh, deliver what we saw in our vision, you know? Uh, I mean, him and Russ Russell that we worked with on the previous record, they have always been the top two for me. And, and this time we knew that we needed to record everything in Sweden because a lot of the guest musicians were here. Uh, so the natural choice was to go with someone that we were 100% sure would deliver the final result that, that we were after. Being more intrigued by the philosophy of horror, I guess, and collaborated with a lot of other writers to come up with this idea of horror as a philosophy and how it connects to the idea of pessimism. Uh, and that's when I got intrigued, you know, uh, to find these borders of the human comprehension and that, you know, we as humans try to invent these defense mechanisms to cope with everyday struggles, you know, like religion and so on. Um, so pessimism for me wasn't really a bleak outlook on life. It's actually more a way to survive a little bit more as a human, to, to live with open eyes. Uh, I mean, because we're the only species on, on, on the planet that uh, are conscious about our own mortality, you know? And that's the kind of fear that constantly drives the human race. And I was very intrigued by these concepts. I would say that I, some of the ideas in this philosophy has uh, triggered my uh, curiosity and uh, I embraced some of them, uh, but I, I, I don't really adhere to any philosophy or religion or something like that. It's, uh, I am very curious and the only thing that I know now when I come of age is that I don't know everything and why should I decide on, yeah, this is the only way to, this is the only truth. I'm too old for that, you know. I I know that no one will ever come up with the, the one truth. Eugene Thacker, one of the other main writers that I've been looking into here and also had some correspondence with you making the record. Uh, he actually contributed lyrics for one of the songs as well. Um, he is saying somewhere along the lines of, you know, like it's right there, the only portal through like, where human comprehension fails 
you know, that's when horror begins a little bit. And that's like an explanation model that could be used in a pessimistic way, you know, where just this little small, tiny piece of gravel in the universe, not only, not even that, you know, and that kind of idea of us being without purpose uh, is the base of pessimistic philosophy, you know, and I think Lovecraft was the first writer who kind of touched upon the idea there, you know, like the uh, meaninglessness of humanity, you know, and that's where they come together a little bit. You know, I don't want to politicize, you know, like what we do, you know, what we do with the planet and what with, you know, human race, of course, it be, you become kind of a misanthrope when you, when you see it on the internet. Yeah. But for us, I, I was more intrigued with the, the human, uh, like the, the inner struggle of humanity, you know, with our consciousness and our fear of dying and, and so on. And uh, how, how the, those things drive us drives us as humans it's almost like a paradox you know we try not to be human you know to to survive in this world with all this pain and suffering but i mean a lot of the philosophers were probably in a pessimistic view would probably you know think it's a good idea for humanity to be extinct because we're only causing pain and suffering you know but uh, of course i won't go that far you know i'm a misanthropic humanist in that sense (laughs) It's, uh, we kind of worked with uh, some of them already on the last record. Uh, so we just expanded uh, the original like quartet into a bigger piece. Uh, uh, I think for us, it's important to, the yeah, emotions are very important in that to get sound, you know, uh, for being a death metal band, it, it, the how we portray our emotions is what's central to, you know, what we want to portray as a band and we have noticed lately that instrumentation like choosing a separate instrument for certain parts make those emotions come even more through you know mm-hmm. you mentioned uh, the flute on uh, touched by the white hands of death even in, like exact same melody if it would have been played on a get- electric guitar it doesn't give you the same feeling as that flute does because it the flute uh, the instrument in has this voice that also connects with your emotions and the same with the saxophone you know and the, the free form uh, improvisational part of that song is very hard to do on with the same kind of uh, emotional impact on on for example an electric guitar so we wanted to make as much possible out of with the to get a, a big emotional impact as possible basically on, on the listener yeah and i think it's uh, what is most important for us is that you should still feel that you are listening to an At The Gate song when you hear it, even if you incorporate other stuff or uh, different arrangements and stuff. Uh, the main challenge for us, because I mean, we could go all crazy and do very different stuff all the time. And that would be kind of easy in a way to make it this weirdest album ever. But for us, it's the challenge is to make it as weird as possible or as interesting as possible within the Atagate's frame, you know? And I think that's uh, what drives us a little bit. Yeah. It feels a little bit like a rebirth of the band to do, to do this kind of record. And we are very excited about going further, <laughs> you know? It, it was very uh, interesting to, to, to play together with a, with a string chord. We used uh, Yo Quail's uh, string chord for that. And, uh, it was very interesting to play together with them, not, not just having them on a recording, you know? Uh, and that's something we would, of course, love to do more of in the future, to have uh, more participants also on stage, you know, to, to bring this uh, fully to the listener, you know? Uh, and Roadburn was probably like a little bit of a confirmation for us, it gave us courage to fulfill all our ideas for this record, you know? Would you, would you bring them? On tour or? Well, well, we'll see what happens uh, with the pandemic when the pandemic stops uh, and uh, what kind of, uh, how can I say it, uh, logistic and economic uh, things uh, that lie ahead for, for doing the most full at the Gates experience. Are you kind of uh, optimistic? 
this time for <laughs> the I'm a, yeah I, I guess uh, I have hopes but I, I'm also uh, try to be realistic about them so but I mean we have shows that are already booked and not uh, cancelled yet for this year uh, and but we have focused a lot on booking so much as we can for the next year 2022 so that we won't stand there without any shows booked if the pandemic uh, restrictions are lifted you know yeah so uh, the full uh, campaign will start in 2022 i guess the rest if something happens it's a bonus <laughs>